Welcome back students. In this video segment we will take a look at one section, section 14.5, the chain rule. The chain rule. If the section sounds familiar, it should. In fact, a lot of the things that we do in this course are just extensions of the things we learned in, in Calculus 1, actually. So we learned about the chain a chain rule in Calculus 1, although we didn't call it a chain rule, we called it the chain rule. So for, for example, just a, a quick example from Calc 1. If we have uh, y equals, let's say, cosine of t squared, t squared. We, uh, we use the chain rule to, to evaluate or to find the derivative of this function. And the chain rule says that we take the derivative of the outside function. The outside function is the function that's last applied when you enter a value of the variable. So when you enter a value of the variable t, first you square it, and then you take the, the cosine. And that's, that's considered the outside function, the cosine. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And we, we evaluate that at the inside function left alone. We don't take the derivative of the inside function. Then we multiply that result by the derivative of the inside function times 2t. This you do automatic, almost automatically, I'm sure. Well, let's take a look at the actual formula for this procedure. So suppose we have y is a function of another function, so a composite function. So y is a function of x and x is a function of t. We then write the chain rule as say y prime equals the derivative of the outside function f prime evaluated at the inside function, so leave the inside function alone, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So this is old news to us. I want to write this formula though using the differential notation. So using differential notation, we would have uh, dy dt equals the derivative of the outside function, so df dx, okay, uh, leaving the inside function alone times the derivative of the inside function, times dx dt. Or we could write dy dx, since y equals f, so dy dx times dx dt. Okay, so we're going to extend this idea to functions of more than than one variable. To do that though, we're going to we're going to use a little device. A little device is called a tree diagram. Tree diagrams are used all over math. Try diagram all over math to to make things easier to use in probability and statistics and calculus all over the place. So, what I mean by a tree diagram is again consider consider the function we were just talking about, or the general case we were just talking about, y equals f of x of t, where x is a function of t. So x is, a, is some x of time, or of t. Okay? So the device goes like this. y depends on x. So y depends, oops, I think I'd like to draw my little line better. y depends on x. So there's, there's one branch. The, the tree goes from y to x along, the branch, along this particular branch, and then x depends on t. So x, from x to t, we construct another branch. So the branches, uh, the branches signify that the, the uh, dependence of one variable on the other. y depends on x, x depends on t. So ultimately, y depends on t. And every time we move along a branch in this, in this device, we take a derivative. So from y to x, we find dy over dx. And then from x to t, we find dx over dt. So ultimately, we can take a derivative of y with respect to t. So that derivative, to find the derivative of y with respect to t, we move along the branches to get from y to t through derivatives. So dy, d, 
uh, dy dt is along the first branch dy dx and then along the second branch dx dt. This, seem, this might seem a little silly to do with, with uh, functions of, of just one variable, but with functions of more than one variable, the, this, um, this tree diagram becomes really convenient. So let's look at the chain rule and let's call this case one for us. Case one. Let z be a function of x and y where x is a function of t, which you can consider time if you want, uh, and y is a function of t. So ultimately z is a function of t. Ultimately, if we were to stuff the, the formulas for, for x and y as functions of time into this function f of xy, we'd have z as a function of t. And we could illustrate that with a tree diagram. z depends on two variables. z depends on the variables x and y, and each of the variables y depend on t. And we, think, we can think about it as every time we move along a branch, we, we take a derivative. So ultimately, there are two pathways, two different pathways along different branches to get from z to t. And that's how that's the idea we use to construct this, this tree diagram. So d, d, uh, oops, dz dt, and it's going to be d and not partial. It's, a, it's an ordinary derivative because z ultimately depends on t. dz dt uh, the derivative from, of z with respect to t can be obtained by moving along two different pathways. We can first move from z to x using a partial derivative. So it's dz partial z partial x and then from x to t along the last branch of that pathway. So times dx dt or which means add we can move from z through y through partial derivative because there are two different pathways to go from from z to t. One takes the direction from x, one takes the dire direction from y, so the, the derivative of z will be with respect to y, and then we move along that last pathway from y to t. And the derivative from y to t will be an ordinary derivative since y only depends on one variable. z depends on two variables, so if we, as we move along the branches considering z, we use partial derivatives. And then from x and y, we simply move to, one, to the remaining variable t, so it's an ordinary derivative. We could have also used uh, the function uh, f, uh, the, 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 the uh, letter f for the function instead of z. So we could have written partial f partial x times dx dt plus partial f partial y times dy dt. Oops, let me clean that y up. dy dt. You have to be very careful with notation. Partial derivatives use partial notation when it's appropriate, ordinary uh, notation when it's when it's appropriate, okay? Okay, let's take a look at a specific example. Yeah, let's take a look at a specific example. So for example, um, use the chain rule. Use the chain rule to compute or to find uh, dz dt if z equals the inverse tangent of y over x, where x equals e to the t, and let's say y equals 1 minus e to the negative t. So let's stop and think about this, what we're doing for a second. We wouldn't need much more than calculus one to do this. If we were just to stuff x and y, the functions of t, e to the t, and one minus e to the negative t, into, into the function z, and then just 
take the derivative using uh, the chain rule and actually we need calculus too for the inverse tangent it would use use um the ordinary the ordinary chain rule that we learned in calc one and plus the new functions that we learn in, in calc 2 inverse tangent and e to the t or whatever. So we wouldn't need a chain rule to do this, but I want to use a chain rule to illustrate this property that, that's good for functions of more than one variable. Okay, so I would construct a tree diagram, although you could just memorize the chain rule for this. Z depends on x and y, which ultimately depend on t. And I would use this tree diagram to construct my chain rule, dz dt. It's an ordinary derivative because ultimately z depends on only one variable. But z in, uh, in the intermediate depends on two variables, x and y. So we first go from z. There are two pathways to t. We first go from z to x, partial z, partial x, then from x with by our ordinary derivatives to t, or we can go from z through y through a partial derivative, because z depends on two variables, then dy dt. From y to t, uh, ordinary derivative since y depends only on one variable. Then we use our, our uh, calculus. So the partial of z with respect to x, well, we're looking at the inverse tangent. Derivative of the inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus whatever we're taking the inverse tangent of squared times uh, the derivative of the inside function with respect to x. The derivative of y over x with respect to x. I'll just do a little temporary thing here. y over x is y x to the negative 1. So the derivative of y over x with respect to x Remember, partial derivative with respect to x holds y constant. The derivative of x to the negative 1 is negative 1 x to the negative 2. So our derivative then is negative y over x squared. Okay, now that is time, times dx dt. Well, x equals e to the t, so dx dt equals e to the t, plus the derivative of z with respect to y. Again, we're using we're taking the derivative of the inverse tangent, so it's one over one plus whatever taking we're taking the inverse tangent of, of times by the chain rule the derivative of the inside with respect to y. The derivative of y over x with respect to y is just one over x. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't believe myself. It is one over x derivative of y is 1. Oh, wow. Okay. Times the derivative of y with respect to t. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of minus or of negative e to the negative t is e to the negative t. Okay. We can clean this up. We can write this as, let's say, if we uh, multiply the negative y and the e to the t together, we get negative y e to the t. If we distribute the x squared into the denominator, we get x squared plus y squared. And then for the second term, if we, uh, the second term is a little trickier. Uh, for the second term, um, we can write the first uh, factor there as x squared over x squared plus y squared. If you multiply numerator and denominator by x squared times the rest of that times the 1 over x. And of course, you can stop the video if you want to take a closer look at the algebra. And maybe a couple more steps here. So we have minus y e to the t over x squared plus y squared. And then write this second term as x, canceling out the x from the 1 over x with one of the factors of x squared over x squared plus y squared. And then we have a common denominator of x squared plus y squared. And finally, minus y e to the t plus x e to the negative t. 
Now, we could we could leave this just like this. In fact, uh, most of the time, your author, the author of your textbook, leaves the solutions in terms of x, y, and and t, which is just fine. It's it's understood though that the x and the y are those original uh, e to the t and one minus e to the negative t. So you could actually stuff those x values as functions of t in there, or you could just leave it leave it like this. I would just leave it like this. Okay, okay. So there's a big question that really pops up right now. If, if you if you didn't if it didn't occur to you, um, my original statement was we could have just we could have just substituted. Uh, x and y into this uh, function of x and y, we would just have z as a function of t, and we just use calc 1 and a little calc 2 with the function, extra functions and stuff. So why would we need a chain rule? The chain rule, the chain rule for functions of more than one variable mostly is mostly for uh, making statements, uh, theoretical statements uh, about uh, partial derivatives of, of, uh, of functions. If, if that didn't make sense, uh, I don't blame you. <laughs> the, the chain rule is, and, and we'll see examples of this coming up, the chain rule is, is not just a computational device for derivatives. It's a, it's a, a way of uh, juggling the kind of mathematics that's done in STEM field uh, subjects for, for general statements. And, and we'll, see that. we'll see that as we go along. So if that didn't make sense, just just hang on. Well, you'll get a good idea of what the chain rule is is um, is mostly for in, in higher level math courses. So um, let's take a look at a more general result, a more general chain rule. Case two, the chain rule. Case two. Let's say case two. Let's say let's let z be a function of two variables again. This extends to any number of variables, by the way, x, y, x, y, z, uh, x, y, w, x, y, t, s. It doesn't really matter how many variables we uh, are considering here. We're just gonna we're just gonna let x be a fun, uh, z be a function of two variables. But we're gonna let x and y be functions of two other variables. So x is a function of s and t it looks like a five and t it's an s and y is a function of s and t so let's assume that the instead of x is being just x and y being functions of just t let's assume they're functions of s and t and this could extend to uh, x is a function of s, t, w, and y is a function of s, t, and w, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're not restricted to just these these uh, four variables uh, x, y, and s, and t. So ultimately, ultimately, z is a function of which variables? Think about it for a second. X, z is a function of two variables x and y, but each of those two variables x and y are functions of s and t. So if we were to stuff those functions, x and y, into, into the function f, how, what two variables, and there's your hint, <laughs> what two variables would z be a function of? They would be s and t. And it, to, to do that, let's construct it, or to see that more clearly, let's construct a tree diagram. z depends on x and y, but each of x and y depend on s and t. So we can go ultimately from z to, to multiple pathways to get to s and t. So z is ultimately a function of s and t. So ultimately, we could take two derivatives of z, one with respect to s and one with respect to t. To construct the tree diagrams, uh, sorry, to construct the, the chain rules then for these two derivatives is very simple. Just use the logic that I used in the, in the case one tree diagram. I could ultimately take a partial of, of z with respect to s. And there are two pathways uh, along, which, uh, along this tree diagram that I can get to s. I can go first from z 
to x by partial derivative because there are two pathways along z uh, that, that's, that split off from z. So partial z, partial x. And then from x, I could go to s through a partial derivative because x is a function of two variables. Or I could go from z through y and then from y to s. I could also take a partial derivative of z with respect to t. Similarly, I can go from z through x and then from x to t, or I can go from z to y and then from y to t. So there are two uh, formulas for the chain rule for, for this particular uh, function. Okay, so let's work a let's work an example. Let's work an example. So let's let z equal e to the x times the sine of y, where x equals s minus t and uh, y equals s squared plus t squared. Okay, so suppose I want, um, let's just take one partial derivative here. Let's take the partial of z with respect to s, or t. Let's just do a different, well, I was going to say, let's do a different variable. We did t before. Let's do partial z, partial s. Yeah. So partial z, partial s. I can to get to from z to s, I could first take a partial of z with respect to x, and we can refer to the tree diagram if, above if you want. And then I could go from x to s, or I could go from z through y, and then from y to s. Okay, so the partial of z with respect to x is e to the x times the sine of y, and the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, times the partial of x with respect to s would be how much? What's the partial of x with respect to s? Derivative of s with respect to s is 1. Derivative of t with respect to s is 0. t is held constant. Plus partial z partial y, the derivative of e to the x sine y is e to the x cosine y, times the partial of y with respect to s would be 2s. Okay, and this is essentially fine. You, you might be able to clean this up, maybe write, factor out the e to the x, so you get sine, whoops, e to the x times the sine of y, uh, let's say plus 2s cosine of y, and that would be just fine. Or you could take the formulas for x and y and as functions of s and t and stuff them into the final result. There's nothing wrong with, with having your, your partial derivatives, though, depend on x and y and s and t if, if, uh, if t were involved. Okay. All right. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is give you an example of the real reason why we learn the, the chain rule. The, the real reason why we, we as STEM, STEM field um, students of calculus, the real reason why we use the, the chain rule is to, is to be able to make uh, general statements about partial derivatives of an infinite number of functions that all of which have the same kind of form and and uh, that probably that probably doesn't sound any better than I said it uh, than, than when I said it a, a little bit ago this um, this example is going to illustrate what I'm talking about uh, this is a very difficult example and I, I really hope that you study it that you study it carefully um, this is this is um, this is one of the more difficult parts of the course. Actually, is this is is um, this 
uh, the kind of mathematics that's done in this example, but it's very, very common in third and fourth year physics, physics courses, engineering courses, to see this kind of manipulations using the, uh, the chain rule. So I'm going to start with a function of x and y. So let's, let's uh, for example, let's let z equal f of x and y. where x and y are given by polar, co polar coordinates, where x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. So ultimately, z is a function of r and theta. And it would be a, probably a good idea for us to have a little bit of a a geometric idea of what's going on here is ultimately this this stuff is this stuff is the kind of math that's used for physical examples of that, or physical problems so z equals to f of x y that's an equation of a surface so here's a here's a surface okay sort of sort of try to visualize a little bit of a an umbrella or whatever okay and this surface lies above uh, a portion of let's say the, fir the first octant uh, or the first the xy plane in the in the first octant okay z is a function of x and y if you enter an x and you enter a y you get a z but to to get a z value on the surface you could also use polar coordinates so z is again z is a function of x and y if you if you let x if you substitute x and, and y into the function from the domain of the function you get a point on the surface okay but that that point on the surface could also be obtained by instead of entering x and y you could enter the polar r and the polar theta okay so here's in red the polar theta and this this uh this kind of thing of, of using polar coordinates or other other systems of coordinates is going to come up when we, we start talking about multiple integration. So it's a good idea that we kind of review this concept here. So we could view the point in the xy plane, x, x comma y, is also r comma theta. And by stating, by stating the z equals f of xy, where x and y are polar coordinates, means that ultimately I could, I could specify an r and theta and then find a z value. Okay, so I would like to find some partial derivatives. I would like the, the partial derivative of z with respect to r. That means as theta is held fixed and r is allowed to vary, what, how fast does the, does the function change or the, the, the z values on the surface? I would also like the partial of z with respect to theta. That's going to be fairly easy. The, the tough part comes in when we want a... Uh, multiple derivative so I want a, a second partial derivative so let's um let's let's work our way toward that okay so for part a so the the, the directions are going to be to, to find find for part a I want the partial derivative of z with respect to r okay and I'll just I'll lay out exactly what we're doing then I want to want then I'm going to want the partial of z with respect to theta and the hard part the, the part that's that's uh that's going to take us some some real careful examination is I want the second partial derivative of z I want the second partial of z first with respect to r and then with respect to theta okay Okay, so let's um let's do let's do part part A first. Okay. Remember though, that this is just a reminder, z equals f of x and y. X is a function of r and theta, x equals r cosine theta, and y is a function of r and theta, y equals r sine theta. So maybe I'll go red for the chain for the tree diagram. Z depends on x and y. And each of x and y depend on r and theta. Okay, so ultimately z depends on r and theta, so derivatives of z will be partial derivatives. So 
Let's, uh, let's use the chain rule to do this. So partial Z, partial R, or two pathways to get to R. We can go first from Z to X, and then from X to R, or we can go from Z to Y, and then from Y to R. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so this is partial Z, partial X. Partial X, partial R, the partial derivative of X with respect to R. Well, X equals R cosine theta. So if we hold theta fixed, the derivative of R with, res uh, X, um, R with respect to R is 1. So we get cosine theta plus partial Z, partial Y times the derivative of y with respect to r holding theta constant is sine theta. And this is perfectly fine. I like to use the subscript notation. It's just a little easier on the eyes. Uh, sine theta. Okay, so b. If you might be thinking, well, can't we go any further? No, no, we don't know what the function of x and y is. So we, we can only leave this partial derivative of z, uh, oh, sorry, partial derivative of z with respect to r with z sub x and z sub y in them. So this is, this is where um, what I, what I, that complicated statement I said twice comes, uh, sort of bears out. I said that the, the chain rule is most often used to make general statements about partial derivatives of an infinite number of functions. I'm, I'm not stating what f of xy is. All of which the have, have the same form. They're functions of x and y where x and y are specifically the polar coordinates. So this is a formula for finding the derivative of z with respect to r whenever z equals some fun differentiable function of x and y where x and y are polar coordinates. So let's find the partial z with respect to theta. Uh, using the chain rule then again, it's, we can go from z to x, then we can go from x to theta, or we can go from z through y, and then from y to theta. So this is partial z, partial x, partial x, partial derivative of x with respect to theta. Remember, x equals r cosine theta. So the partial derivative of cosine is of theta is negative sine theta. So we get negative r sine theta plus partial z partial y. Feel free to stop the video if you're, if you're not sure about these derivatives. Partial derivative of y with respect to theta. The derivative, oh, sorry about that. The derivative of sine of y is a uh, sine of theta is cosine of theta. So we get r cosine of theta. And I prefer to use subscript notation. It's just easier for me, I think, to to use it than using the partial notation. So you can use combinations of partial notation and subscript notation. It's all good. It's all good. And then you're going to see that happen in our, in our last example. Our last example, and this is the one that I anticipate is going to take you, as you go through the homework in these with these specific types of problems, it may take you in this section um, anywhere from one to uh, one and a half or two hours or, or more to work the specific problems that involve these multiple derivatives. Take them very, very slowly and take them very, very seriously. Um, they will represent a significant uh, amount of work on your, on your next exam as they are extremely important in STEM field math courses. Okay, so C is very, 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 very important. Okay, I want a second partial first with respect to r and then with respect to theta. Okay, in order to do this, I'm going to use, I'm going to use tree diagrams. Now, z depended on x and y. I think I'd like to write them a little, a little better. z depends 
on it looks the same <laughs> on x and y that's all right and x depend on r and x and y depend on both on r and theta now z sub x what does that depend on this is really a very easy question that I, that I just posed so don't don't panic z depends on x and y so if you take a partial derivative of z with respect to x of a function of x and y what does it depend on it still depends on x and y if you're if you're just if you miss what i said there if z equals x squared plus y squared z sub x is well let's say y squared x <laughs> z sub x is 2x plus y squared Okay. So a derivative of a function of x and y still generally depend on the same two variables, x and y. Okay. They don't have to. If I had, if I had just x squared plus y squared, z sub x would be 2x. It would only depend on x. But generally, when you take the derivative of a function of, of, of a, a set of variables, that derivative also depends on those same variables. And x and y still depend, oops, I still don't want to stay with red. x and y still depend on r and theta. This, it will become clear why I'm doing this in this example, so just bear with me. But also, if you take a derivative of a function of x and y with respect to y, that function will still depend on x and y. And those x's and y's still depend on the polar coordinates r and theta, okay? Okay, so let's dig into this. <clears throat> let's find the second partial derivative. Well, let's find the second partial derivative of z, first with respect to r and then with respect to theta. Well, this is just the derivative with respect to theta of partial z, partial r. That's, what the, that's exactly what the notation says. Okay, so this is nothing more than the partial with respect to theta of partial z, partial r, but we have partial z, partial r in part a. It's z sub x cosine plus z sub y sine. So let's substitute that in. So this is the partial with respect to theta of z sub x cosine theta plus z sub y sine theta. Take this very slowly. At this point, there are common mistakes. There, there's an extremely common mistake. The common mistake in, in, is this, that is for students to take the derivative with respect to, to theta of z sub x cosine as minus z sub x, this is wrong, sine absolutely wrong this is absolutely absolutely incorrect and it's also absolutely absolutely common for students to do this okay so it's going away <laughs> now look at my tree diagram look at my tree diagram above which is going to suddenly become green so we can focus on it on z sub x z sub x depends ultimately on two variables, r and theta. So z sub x, that z sub x right there, that depends on r and theta. And this guy, cosine theta, depends on theta. Okay, so I'm taking a derivative with respect to theta of a product of two functions of theta. So I need to use the product rule on this. Okay, so I want to make sure you're okay with that. Okay, I'm going to put my in parentheses here. So I'm going to use the product rule. So we need product rule. And that's what's going to appear in the next step. So the product rule says product rule says we have the derivative of the first with respect to theta times the second plus the first z sub x 
times the derivative with respect to theta of cosine theta, which is negative sine theta. So you see it's getting kind of rough here. Okay, so plus, now we need to do the same thing with z sub y sine of theta. I'm going to try to be clever and make a point here. Bear with me. Okay. Oops. Making a point here, making your eyes go nuts though. All right. Uh, let's do this. I guess I could have just rewritten it, huh? <laughs> I um, I wanted to copy it to illustrate that we have to do the same thing for the uh, next term. And my getting fancy really didn't work. Don't get fancy, Leon. <laughs> okay, so we need the product rule on that second term. The product rule says the derivative of the first, so partial with respect to theta of the first of z sub y times the second plus the first z sub y times the derivative of the second with respect to theta. Derivative of sine is cosine. Okay. And boy, have we got some work to do here. This, uh, this, the work that needs to be done is in this and this term. Now, back to my tree diagrams with uh, z sub x. z sub x ultimately depends on r and theta. Okay, so if I want the derivative with respect to theta of z sub x, I really want that tree. I want that tree available to us. Please bear with me. Oops. Let's see. Oh. Oops, 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 oops. Oh my goodness, I'm making a mess. Let's see. Okay, so I make that right about there. I want to copy that little tree diagram. Okay. okay. So that little um, partial with respect to theta of zx, to get it, I'm going to refer to my tree diagram. Okay. So this is partial zx with respect to x, partial zx with respect to x, times partial x partial theta, plus partial zx with respect to y, times partial y partial theta. I'm using the tree diagram just to construct that very first partial derivative, that very first partial derivative. Okay, and it's all of that times cosine. Okay, so you see how this is this is blossoming into this, this really this really big um, stuff. <laughs> All right, so let me clear up the board a little bit. Uh, I would like to take this, move it over. Ah, it's not going to let me move it. I'd like to take this. I'd like to move it if, I, if I'm allowed. Oops. Another second here. Oh, wow. There we are. Okay, I'm moving it down a little bit. And I'm going to take that, that green sub x and replace it with sub y. So I'm going to need that in that second, uh, in the third expression here. The, the z sub x times negative sine uh, and the z sub x times uh, cosine, or z sub y times cosine. I'm going to put those at the end. Okay. 
Right now, I want to deal with the partial with respect to theta of z sub y. Okay, so this is uh, the partial of z sub y with respect to x. Okay, how did I get that? I can move from zy, there's the tree diagram focus on, to x, partial zy with respect to x, times partial x partial theta, partial x partial theta, or, oops, I don't want red there, or, partial zy with respect to y. Okay. Partial zy with respect to y times partial y partial theta. Partial y partial theta. All of that times the sine of theta. That's the, oops, that's the stuff in the brackets times sine of theta, plus the last, the last two terms. The last two terms are really kind of insignificant here. So minus z sub x sine theta plus z sub y cosine theta. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to continue with this. Let's get this finished. Let me erase my tree diagram here. I don't believe we need any tree diagrams anymore. We just need to do some algebra. Now, partial z sub x with respect to x. What's partial z sub x with respect to x? That's just z x x. Partial x partial theta. Remember, x equals r cosine theta. So partial z Partial x times partial x partial theta is minus r sine theta plus partial z with respect to y is zxy times partial y with respect to theta. Derivative of r sine theta is r cosine theta. All of this is times cosine of theta okay, plus the next major term, <clears throat> partial zy with respect to x. We're now in the, in the second term, big term. Partial zy with respect to x is zyx. Partial x partial theta is minus r sine theta r sine theta plus partial zy with respect to y is zyy times partial y partial theta is r cosine theta and all of that is times sine of theta and then plus the stragglers z sub x minus z sub x sine plus z sub y cosine okay at this point we've done the the di differentiation at this point all the all the calculus is done well except for one thing the um we have we have mixed partials going on here we have z x y and we have z y x we have z x y which i'm going to highlight in let's say red and we have zyx, which I would also highlight in red. And what do they have in common? They are equal. They are, in fact, equal. So we can simplify further. Um, <clears throat> uh, how do we want to do this? OK. We can distribute the cosine, and we're looking at, we're concentrating on the first, the first big term here. We can distri distribute the cosine, so we're going to have z sub x, uh, z x x times negative r sine cosine. Okay, so if I distribute the cosine, I'm going to get z sub x, z x x times negative r sine cosine. Now in the second major term, um, if I distribute the sine through the second 
part of that term, I'm going to have zyy times r sine cosine. What I'm doing now is, is purely stylistic. So I could write this, so in other words, you, can, you don't have to write this exactly the way I'm doing this. Uh, both those terms that I've distributed in green have r sine cosine and then times zyy minus zxx. Okay, now I'm going to continue to distribute. So if I distribute in green above, I have zxy r cosine squared. I have zxy r cosine squared. And what if I do that same thing in the second major term? I'm going to have zxy or zyx, either or, um, minus r sine squared. Okay, so what I can do is take the common r, I'm going to have cosine squared for, for the first one, so I'm going to get r cosine squared zxy, and I'm going to get a plus, well there should be a minus, mm. oh no, no, there it is, I'm sorry, it is minus, minus sine squared. It's very easy to get caught up in all this, even after three decades of doing the same problem on the board. Okay, and then tack on the stragglers. Minus ZX sine plus ZY cosine. That is the formula for the derivative <clears throat> of the second derivative of Z, first with respect to. Uh, R and then with respect to the theta. This uh, this is going to be a good example for you when you get to the toward the toward the last portion of the homework for this section. You, you're you're going to be asked to do this kind of computation a few times. Um, I also realize I didn't put in the factor z x y. Slipping that in there. Um, I, want to I want to fix that up a little bit. doesn't look real nice. Okay. Minus zx, sorry about that, sine theta plus zy cosine theta. Okay. This is as hard as, as this, this uh, differentiation um, differentiation gets. With, with, uh, I'm going to just say, gonna say with the chain rule, but just overall with differentiation, it, it doesn't get any harder than this. I want to end this this uh, video segment with a couple of a couple of um, nice applications of the uh, the chain rule. <clears throat> okay. Well, this is this uh, this last example. This last application has to do with reconsidering something that you did in Calc one. In Calc 1, you did, oh, you did a whole lot of things. And in Calc 1, one of the things that was really labor intensive was implicit differentiation. I'm going to show you a formula for what's called speedy implicit differentiation. Speedy implicit differentiation. Differentiation. I'm going to show you a, uh, a formula that would have made the the process of finding implicit derivatives um, a lot easier in Calc one. But don't don't get too angry though, because uh, we weren't able to show you this in Calc one because we didn't have partial derivatives in Calc one. We had to concentrate on on just the ordinary differentiation in Calc one. So first I'm going to do an example by the, the plain old Calc 1 technique, okay, which you can scroll through if you want, if you want to, or you can zip through on the, on the video if you don't want to see the details. But don't zip too far because I'm going to show you also a formula for doing this very, very, very quickly. So from Calc 1, find, find y prime if 3xy equals the cosine of x plus y. Standard, standard Calc 1 problem. Okay, 
So the the result in, we would get the result in calc one would be obtained by taking the derivative with respect to x of both sides. And of course, we're assuming that that uh, x and y are not independent variables. X is the independent variable. That, that y depends on x. So take the derivative of both sides. Then we use the the product rule on the left hand side. Three is a constant. So the derivative of x y is by the product rule derivative of x times y plus x times the derivative of y, which is y prime. And on the right hand side, the derivative of cosine is negative sine of x plus y times by the chain rule, the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of x is 1, the derivative of y is y prime. Okay, then all the, the algebra comes into play here. Most of the algebra comes in. We have to isolate y prime. So I would distribute the 3 on the left. And I would distribute the negative sine xy on the right. Negative sine of x plus y, rather. Negative sine of x plus y times 1 minus uh, y prime times the sine of x plus y. What I would do next, I would get the uh, terms with the y prime on one side, so 3x, so labor tense at 3xy prime plus y prime times sine of x plus y equals the negative sine of x plus y. And then I'm going to subtract the 3y that's on the left hand side because it doesn't have a y prime. Factor out the y prime. Plus the sine of x plus y. Maybe well, you could factor out a negative from the right, or you could just leave the negative unfactored. I'll factor it out. Then divide both sides by whatever's keeping us from having a y prime. Divide both sides by 3x plus sine of x plus y. So y prime equals that negative. I'll factor out uh, from the whole thing the whole fractional expression and I want to write this as I just feel like writing the sine first sine of x plus y plus 3x okay okay so what is speedy implicit differentiation the chain rule allows us to find a formula for speedy implicit differentiation. So let's let's do this more generally. We started with uh, 3xy equals cosine of x plus y. Okay, we started out with 3xy uh, equals cosine of x plus y. I could have also had started with cosine of x plus y minus 3xy equals 0. I, just, I didn't have to have the 3xy on that side. The reason I wrote it this way is because this looks like some capital F of xy equals 0. And this is how we can write every implicit uh, differentiation form uh, uh, problem. It starts out as some function, capital F of x, y equals 0. I'm getting a little sloppy with it here. Okay. That F looks like an E. Here we are. So let's start with F of x, y equals 0, where, where we're assuming that y depends on x. So theoretically, we could solve for, for some function y as a, func as a function of x. OK, so let's let w equal that function of x and y, which equals 0. <laughs> so the function f depends on x and y. And x definitely depends on x. It just equals x. Okay, And I'm assuming that y is a function of x. Okay, So I can construct a tree diagram for the derivative of w. Now, 
W then ultimately depends on only one variable x. W depends on, on W equals f, and f depends on x and y, but x and y just depend on x. So ultimately W is just a function of x. So if I want a derivative of W, it'll be an ordinary derivative. Okay, and I'm going to use the chain rule to expand on that. The chain rule says it's going to be the partial of f with respect to x times the derivative of x with respect to x plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to x. And what's that going to equal? Well, look what w equals. W equals zero. So the partial, or so the derivative of W with respect to X, the derivative of zero is zero. Okay, so this is just F capital F sub X times one plus capital F sub Y times uh, dy dx y prime equals zero. Solve for y prime. It looks like I'm doing some sort of magic here. I'm really not. It just looks like it because I'm throwing around these derivatives. Uh, you know, it could look haphazard, but it's not. It's very, very predicted, very, very methodical. Now, back to the, the idea of speedy implicit differentiation. Remember, recall, f x, y equals 0. Okay. If f of x, y equals 0, then y prime is nothing more than uh, the opposite of the fractional expression, partial derivative of the big F with respect to x over the partial derivative of big F with respect to y. So how is that speedy implicit differentiation? Back to our original problem back to original problem problem that was cosine of x plus y minus 3xy equals 0 okay that's f on the left okay now that the original the original uh, implicit differentiation that I did as a review of calc 1 well, that took maybe three minutes, three and a half minutes. It takes only it takes less than thirty seconds to take to find that derivative. Y prime equals negative. What's the derivative of f with respect to x? What's the derivative of cosine? It's negative sine of x plus y times the derivative of the inside with respect to x is just one. What's the derivative of three xy with respect to x? Uh, it is uh, 3y, okay? Okay, so now the uh, over f sub y, what's the derivative of cosine with respect to y? It's negative sine of x plus y times the derivative of the inside with respect to y is 1. Derivative of minus 3xy with respect to y is minus 3x. Okay, I do believe this is the same result that we got uh, above. I'm hoping this is the result we got above. Where is it? Oh my goodness, I keep pushing things and make things act weird. Okay, there's our result from, from all that work. That's our result from earlier. I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to paste it next to our current result. God, I keep doing that. I'm going to put copy it and paste it next to our current result. Okay. So our current result from speedy implicit differentiation... <laughs> Uh, looks like uh, it has three minuses in it. Well, factor out the no the negative in the numerator, factor out the negative in the denominator, and cancel those negatives and leave the original negative. Hope that made some sense. 
plus 3y sine of x plus y. Oops. Clean that out. Plus 3x. It is exactly the same. It is exactly the same. But it took us a fraction of the time. Okay, so this so it was from earlier. It is exactly the same as the result I got by speedy implicit differentiation. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is <clears throat> we're going to finish up this video segment with a speedy differentiation formula for functions of two variables. It's going to it's going to go pretty much the same way. Uh, the derivation wise and usage wise as it did with um with this last example okay so let's um let's take a look at an example find z sub x if x y z equals the cosine of x plus y plus z so we have to understand what this means. We're given some formula or an equation that, that has three variables in it. And we're assuming that z is a function of x and y. It's impossible to solve for z using finite combinations of elementary functions. But if we could, it would depend on x and y. So I want the derivative of z with respect to x. So what we do is we start with a similar idea. Let f of x, y, z equals zero. So our our example, if we subtracted x, y, z from both sides, or subtracted cosine from both sides, we would have some function of x, y, z equals zero. Okay, and with or where we're assuming that z, that z variable, depends on x and y. So z equals a function of x and y. Okay, so let's let W equal F of X, Y, and Z. Okay, let's make this a little better. Okay, whatever. <clears throat> so um, W, or the function F, depends on three variables. Uh, depends on x, depends on y, depends on z. Now we're assuming that z depends on x and y. But I claim x depends on x and y. It's just equal to x. You can have x of... Uh, here, let's do it this way. You can have a function of two variables that just depend on x. g of x, y equals just x cylinder if you were to graph it okay so you don't have to have both variables in the function to consider the function of two variables to consider the function of two variables similarly y depends on x and y it just simply equals itself but that's okay you can have uh, h of x y just equals y okay, there's nothing wrong with that okay so i'm doing this for the sake of uh uh being able to have our chain rule work out the way we've been uh, forming the chain rule with tree diagrams before. So um, ultimately, W depends on two variables, X and Y. So we're letting W equal F of X, Y, Z, but that W equals zero. Okay, that function, when you bring the X, Y, Z, when you take the X, Y, Z to the other side, you get F, a capital F of X, Y, Z equals zero. All right. So I'm going to take the derivative of w with respect to x. So the partial derivative of w with respect, not an ordinary, but partial derivative, because w depends on two variables. Now I use the chain rule. It's partial f, partial x, partial x with respect to x, plus partial of f with respect to y, times the partial of y with respect to x plus the partial of f 
with respect to z times the partial of z with respect to x. And that must equal 0, because ultimately w equals 0. So the derivative, any derivative of, of 0 is just 0. So simplify this. This is f sub x. The partial of x with respect to itself is 1 plus f sub y. What's the partial of y with respect to x? Well, if I take the derivative of y with respect to x, that means I'm holding y constant. So that's 0. Plus f z zx. Eh, I could, I'll just write it partial z partial x. I could write it zx equals 0. So this says the partial of z with respect to x is negative fx over fz. Okay. Similarly, similarly, if I took the partial derivative of w with respect to y, I would get partial z partial y equals, what do you think? Minus f y over f z. So these are speedy partial derivative, speedy implicit differentiations formulas for partial derivatives. So let's go back to our original. Uh, find z sub x of x, y, z equals cosine of x plus y plus z. So back to uh, x, y, z uh, equals cosine of x plus y plus z. So first of all, I need the capital F function. So I need uh, f of x, y, z equals 0. Doesn't matter which side you put stuff on. So subtract x, y, z from both sides. And that's my capital F of x, y, z. And look at how simple this is. z sub x, z sub x, partial z, partial x, is minus f x over f z minus the derivative of this function with respect to x, the derivative of cosine is negative sine of x plus y plus z. The derivative of x, y, z with respect to x is just y, z. Okay. Uh, over f sub z, the derivative of the big capital F of x, y, z with respect to z, the derivative of cosine is still negative sine of x plus y plus z times the derivative of the inside is just 1 with respect to z. The derivative of x, y, z with respect to z is x, y. I could cancel the minuses, factor a minus out of the numerator and denominator and cancel them out. The, the point is that the speedy differentiation formula for, for implicit differentiation of functions of, of uh, two variables is very, very simple to apply. Let's see, plus x, y. Okay. Two very powerful applications of the chain rule. And that brings us to the end of our section. So go ahead and dig into homework whenever, as soon as you get a chance, whenever you get a chance, and as soon as you get a chance, uh, start working on the homework for section 14.5. Those problems where you're supposed to use uh, the chain rule to do a, a similar example that I did with uh, the second partial of z with respect to r and then theta, those are going to require some significant time. So um, try to try to dedicate some some uh, really good specific or uh, dedicate some good time to this uh, section. <laughs> and unusual, I'm looking forward to talking with you all again very soon.